Many people have problems with art and not with reality. So why is art different? It's pretty simple, right? This is knowledge, this is thinking, this is thought. Yeah, it does something strange with your head. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. Bring it. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. My name is Ando. Well, the warm months have fully settled upon the land, and uh, with every Danish summer comes the yearly tradition of the Roskilde Festival. It's one of the world's largest music festivals. Something around, I don't know, 130,000 people attend the festival, which is run by a nonprofit organization. And for many years now, they have also had a, uh, a pretty surprisingly ambitious art zone during the festival with running themes and critical commentary on social and political issues. This year, for example, they built four one-to-one replicas of the proposed wall types for uh, the Donald's anti-cooties barrier between Mexico and the U.S., And uh, I had the pleasure of seeing this uh, art zone and talking to some of the folks involved. It was pretty cool to see a large festival working on promoting critical and contemporary art. And aside from a few issues with the user design, I think it worked out pretty well. It's, uh, It's certainly very ambitious. There are two big announcements to make here before we start. The first one is that we've taken the next big step with the platform we built, Cultural Bandwidth. We now have relaunched the website with six different podcasts on the network. We are building the community of like-minded podcasters, and it's uh, it's amazing. So please go and check out culturalbandwidth.com to see more and check out all the other great podcasts we have on the platform. The other announcement is that intact with our expanded podcast network, we have started to engage with sponsors as well. And this is an attempt to create some sort of sustainability in this. So we have the first one on board, and it's actually a longtime supporter and, you know, at this point, a friend of the show, Artland. Artland is an app and a community. It's founded on a vision of connecting art collectors, art lovers, galleries, artists from all over the world into this kind of global art community. They have this great app. They produce a lot of interesting content, including interviews and uh, artist profiles and such. I've met them. I know who they are, and they are in it for all the right reasons. So please support us and support them and check them out at theartlandapp.com. And, uh, you know, in fact, this episode you're about to listen to is brought to you in collaboration with Artland. Without them, this never would have been possible. So do be sure to check them out. All right, we'll start this episode with the head curator of the Roskilde Festival Art Zone, Meta Woller. Um, but I'm curious. So you're the head curator of the Roscoe Lard program, right? I am, yeah. How does that happen? How it happened? Yeah, how, does, how do you get well, that job? Well, I think um, I applied for the job um, and uh, the reason being that I've always worked with the, the white cube in some way, commenting on it in some kind of way and looking into an alternative. The white cube is um, an exhibition space that is carrying a value back from the 30s that I find quite problematic in many ways. What we do at Rascal the Festival is that we work with the exhibition space. There are no walls here. There are no spaces. We build everything from ground. And a non-art public in a lot of cases. What, sorry? And a non-art public, not the usual exactly. people who come out to exactly. Schlangenborg, for example. Or exactly. Something. And then, um, yeah, so there was that part. And then also um, the opportunity to work with music. I've always combined music and art in the exhibitions I've curated. So I've looked yeah, into these different alternative exhibition spaces is everything I do. Um, so in that sense, it just made made sense for me to be here. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting context. That's what I keep talking about with other people is about how, how different it is than the usual working frame that, yeah. that we, we come from as artists and from art people, you know. So I feel like it must be also somewhat daunting for you in a way a little challenging because it's so different than the white cube 
it it is, and also because I've been used to commenting on their spaces I exhibited in. Right, exactly. So, exactly, so I did an exhibition about love, but um, related to narcissism, in a uh, swimming pool, a fitness center, and and commenting on the whole like bodybuilding um, history and values connected to that. Um, but then kind of commenting on that space and where we were and exhibited the art in a different space than usual. So being in a space that were actually related to the topic, in other words. But here, we have to build it from the ground. But it's literally a field. It's literally <laughs> a field, a grass field. So how do you make that space and also within a week? Right. Yeah, so there's right. those challenges going on. Right. Yeah. Did you... What, did, what was it like then? What was it? What did it feel like to do that? Um, I think it's more um, adapt to working with tents in many situations. Right. Yeah, flexible spaces. Yeah. yeah, but then I think you can see when when you meet the quality walls, the project we have up there. I think you can comment on spaces in many ways and also discuss what is a, what is a space. Like, does it have to be physical in order to create a space? So the walls up there are 10 meter tall and six meter wide. The prototypes of uh, the walls that uh, President Donald Trump built at the border near um, uh, between Mexico and um, the United States of America. And here we created four copies of them. So <clears throat> The reason we have those are because there is an Atlantic Swiss artist uh, named Christophe Bikel, um who did a, particip- a petition, what do you say, like a... Um, petition. Petition, right. He did a petition. Petition. Yeah. Um, where he uh, he claimed that the wall should be made um, national monuments. So you're kind of looking in... Yeah, so there and there are many opinions about that project also due to the value of the original walls here we make in copies, which is a very important part of it. But the question they raise is uh, what happens when you have this nationalistic, uh, political, economic project um, that wants to exclude um, populations or, or a population and then bringing it into a cultural capital, the, the art field, um, where suddenly um, objects that are owned by everybody. So um, in that sense, it's also, I think that like exhibition design is what I work with and also really important of my practice. So, yeah. Well, I think it worked really well here. Uh, a, because it's something we've heard a lot about, but no one's seen it really, mm. you know, so you actually get a chance to experience the scale of it. But then also in relation to other things. So Lily Beth's performance was right in front of it. And then these uh, these women uh, putting on these clothes start to look like refugees. And then it really starts becoming this multi-tiered experience uh, in a public space where people are just kind of, you know, let's say a third of the audience just happens to be there. And it's like, whoa, what's this, you know? And that's that's again totally outside of that art context. We're used to the the, the 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 we're we're talking to the choir. People know what they're walking into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also because it's not only a situation in the United States. It's like a worldwide tendency where we see countries blocking borders to uh, exclude communities, whereas in our school festival we want to include communities. Um, and then there's also the thing about creating spaces where the audience is in some kind of way so we are out there making the spaces there and the physical tactile and sensors part is a really important part of the art program like in in the western we still tend to separate the mind from the body we cannot perceive the world without your body in it it has to move in order for you to move around in it and when your body is triggered so is your mind so therefore we don't have the spaces but what we always think about is the tactile physical sensuous part of it that's also <clears throat> why art zone is this very like special zone where you cannot um, you feel you're entering because we have this path where you will step onto the minute you are there yeah. and all the works are working with this physical essential part so you you're aware or your bo- your body's triggered into now you're in a new area yeah and you've done a really good job of selecting artists that work in that manner you know with jillian here with the slumpies uh, and that's a very tactile body activation kind of kind of thing and you can see people are loving it people are absolutely integrating uh their festival experience with them um 
just to wrap it up, is there any sort of like uh, challenges that you found, like, or anything that popped up for you that was particularly like tough to deal with out, you know, outside of the usual context? Um, no, I just, I just think it's more. There's such a huge difference from looking at a paper and doing plans and being on emails. <laughs> yeah, the logistics here are huge. Exactly, so and when you people. are here, and that's also why the physical and sensuous part is so important because it's so different, yeah. and there's so many things you cannot decide or just looks different when you are out out here seeing it, and then yeah, you need to regroup or yeah. Right, and people have to make proposals to you, and you have to make proposals to the Roskilde Festival. You know, and all it's all these steps involved. Yeah. I think no that's that's fine as long as it's not a security issue but just yeah it's just um yeah there's just certain things you cannot control beforehand that's also maybe the beautiful part of it but um, right, flexibility it, is yeah. probably pretty key here it, it's a kind of a headliner in yeah. the yeah in here yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, are you happy with the way it turned out? I'm very happy. We've been so lucky to work with the most incredible artists, architects, designers, programmers. I can only imagine you've been working 24 hours a day for the past. Yeah, it's been quite hectic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you but, get to relax now, or is it not over till? Yeah, there's uh, always the part after after you done exhibitions that you. I actually always forget about it, yeah. but, <laughs> but like it's almost about. Empty, yeah, <laughs> it's almost uh, like the same big job, but um, yeah, yeah. But I, I will relax and have some vacation at some point. Cool. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Once again, that was the head curator of the Roskilde Festival Art Zone, Meta Wohler. And next up, we have Oscar Colliander, a Swedish Danish artist living here in Copenhagen, who made a really interesting project. Yeah. Uh, not the um, critical, journalistic, uh, outward-facing discussion, yeah. but the uh, internal, what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Everyone's just <laughs> in a group together going, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. What, uh, is, what is this? What is that? Yeah. How do we do this? Et cetera, et cetera. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? There you go. You, you figured this out. It's, it's quite <laughs> funny. Like uh, I had a really good teacher in, in, in my kind of first year of art school where... He had to say the, the, the three H's, uh, like, a, the, like the letter H, mm. um, but it's in Danish. It's, um, but actually, you can, well, I know, can't really translate it to English because it's uh, well, for then, what for? Why, so, how, what? Yeah, right? exactly. Why, how, why? Why, how, why? And <laughs> the, two fir- the two first are simple, but the why right. is the difficult one. Right. I spend a lot of time actually on the podcast asking people why do we do what we do and what is art for, mm. and I just realized that there's no there is no answer. It is just because. No, 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 no. I think there is, I think there is wise. Sure, but it's individual. There is no yeah, yeah. There's not 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 a uh, universal truth right to it. Uh, no, nah, no. I, I I'm always I've been struggling and also thinking a lot about why. I do it and why like because I in, in, in essence I do it for myself because I uh, I think with my hands and mm. I'm, I'm like a physical thinker mm-hmm. and I try to understand the world around me especially um, I like to call it like infrastructures no that's the, not that's just or infrastructure like systems maybe. but yeah the underlying systems mm-hmm. why mm-hmm. like the things that are part of society and affects us a lot but we don't really see mm. um, and now it's been a lot about technology because that's so pervasives everywhere but we don't see it that much sure um well that brings us into here because i talked to jillian earlier yeah who made these slumpies and that's very much about our human interaction with technology mm. uh these sculptures where you kind of interact but then i you know when we got here we see that your work is installed together with them right here yeah. in the middle so in the essence of time i just kind of curious about you know what was your thinking behind this work how did it happen uh, what's the process yeah well um, I, my, my absolute first idea was really, really different. Like the number we're exactly the same was 25. But uh, I, I've been fascinated by these kind of uh, scarecrow uh, birds. That is like a, a kite bird, mm-hmm. kite bird of prey. Yeah, they yeah, put yeah, yeah buildings. I've seen those. Um, and my idea was just put up 25 of those. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, well, if there's no wind, they're just going to fuck up and if, if people walk with like a uh, fly it's gonna ra- tangle and right uh, and all these kind of 
And a day like today, well, yeah, there would yeah. be nothing. Yeah, uh, and and then um, I kept like asking around, and and then I got this informa- information that they were actually doing tracking on the area, and I was reading about the festival, and they had these kind of two themes going on. So one was like the economic equality, like this overall theme, like this equality theme over three years mm. has been social, cultural, and now economic equality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the art zone had a theme of um, human, non-human. Right. So like the human's interaction with technology, basically. Um, and then that all kind of sp- played really well with things I was interested in. Mm. So, and all this just thinking just over a while just kept kind of bubbling in my head. And and uh, and then I was in an exhibition in Norway where someone was working with wind barbs. Um, and this work kind of, kind of be- became there where mm. um, I wanted to do basically a wind map, but of kind of data flows of people's movements as kind of digital doubles as data uh, and how you can kind of read people's movements as a, as a, as a kind of wind map. Mm-hmm. Um, so where's the data coming from for the these? The data is coming from the, um, well, there was different ways of, of choosing where to get it from. Mm. But uh, I, in the end, I, I've chosen to do it through the Roskilde Festival app. Okay, so they have they have their own data streams running. So basically when you get the app you they ask you can we use your location data for improving the festival and so on mm. and, uh, and they do it for two reasons one is to uh, be able to send security people and stuff to the right places when you see oh there's uh, a lot of people are going to this place let's send more right, uh, right. people there and the other thing is to kind of analyze afterwards and see where is bottlenecks where where can we improve the layout of the festival for next year right um but um, then I could get access to this information. And also, be, I liked because you, it asks you if you want to, part, uh, want to, be able, want to share your data. Unlike so, so many an, other things. <laughs> as an ethical standpoint, uh, I think that's really good. Yeah. Like a lot of companies that, you know, of course, I could have used triangulation of the uh, radio antenna, like the 3G antennas. Right. And then I wouldn't have to ask anybody, but it wouldn't be ethically good right 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 uh, and 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 of course yeah i love the companies uh who go into kind of selling personal information and selling data about people uh, as a commodity um don't ask <laughs> right but but for me as an artist I, I i prefer to kind of highlight things but not being uh, doing bad by by showing mm-hmm. up you know not being bad to show bad right Right, right, that's a typical artist maneuver. Like, hey, it's just a, you know, it's it's to highlight the problem that I do this. Yeah, but I'm actually doing it with <laughs> with uh, an, a, from an ethical in an ethical way, which yeah. I'm really happy about being able to do. Yeah. Um, well, how did you get involved here? How did you, did they just reach out to you? Yeah, or? actually, it was. Um, I, I I think it was because I did a work last year that got quite a lot of traction. And then here at the festival, uh, no, uh, my kind of degree show from art school, uh, and that we combined with other things I've done. I think, I think that made him kind of ask me to, you know, come have a look and see if you can come up with something, something right. that's fitting for the festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there's many reasons why I said yes. Um, one of them was that I was able to work in a scale that's uh, not usual as an artist. Yeah. It's really, really big, mm-hmm. um, like physical scale. Uh, and then, of course, there's a huge, huge audience uh, who I normally don't reach out to uh, or have access to. So, uh, you know, I like to show my work for as many people as possible. It's a whole different platform. It's a mostly non-art crowd, yeah. I guess you could say, or at least it's not the usual context. Well, the usual yeah, frame. but it's a cultural crowd. People here are here for the music, mostly. Right. But if you're here for music, it also means you're quite often like somewhat interested in other culture right so it's it's kind of an informed mm. audience but not a specifically art fine art audience uh, so it's, it's kind of like a sweet spot in a mm. way have you interacted at all with people here? yeah but yeah, well i've been i've been staying around to work a lot and i have talking to people people come up and ask about it and uh it's been just really really positive mm. um 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of those works that if you unpack a little bit more what's going on, it becomes more meaningful. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In and of itself, I thought at first it was just uh, reacting to wind. But then if you sit and watch for a little bit, you can see they're moving independently. Yeah. Yeah, they're actually their enemies, the wind, really, because the, the wind with a really strong gust, it can actually change the position of them. Mm. So it actually built that it has to kind of... So self. the natural influence also. Yeah, exists. so it's this battle between technology and nature in a mm. way. Um, but it, it, it does kind of reset every three minutes. It, it checks its position and it kind of goes back. Then right. the wind has to fight it again. Right. Well, it's funny because when we came, they were all facing pretty much the same direction. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, that's yeah. the wind. It well, in the early day, now. you have a lot of people kind of moving into this the zone. Ah, of course. So you have quite... Um, so by the end of the day, it's a lot crazier in a way. Yes, exactly. Uh, and and it would go, especially when like something is starting to happen at orange stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have a lot of people, arrows going inwards and then a lot of arrows going outwards after the concerts. Right. And in the night, there's the lights as well. Right. So they also have like little LEDs on the top. Oh, that's and cool. And they uh, grow brighter where there's a lot of people mm. and less bright where there's few have you been documenting it properly do you have video well not an evening but i have to go home um well, well my girl my girlfriend's just gone through surgery so uh i need to go home and take care of her yes you do <laughs> that's how that works so uh but yeah, yeah. I mean, you should try to get some documentation art over art um but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You should try to get some documentation of it, I think. Yeah. Because uh, it would, it, you know, in a way, would finish the work, seeing it in that context. It, yeah, it does. Well, I've asked the, 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 the this, of course, this being a huge organization, there's photographers and videographers mm. employed by the festival who I can ask to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's really lucky. Perfect. I'll tell you what. Uh, we just got started. I want to talk to you more. So let's do an actual episode in town. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, that'd be Once. great. Just kind of. Yeah, so about the bigger picture. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. And that was Oscar Coliander. And now for the final recording I have from the festival, we have Lilybeth Cuenca Rasmussen, who you might remember from episode 48 of this program. Check it out if you haven't heard it. Um, but yeah, I uh, yeah we just saw the performance and everything, and I thought it went really well. I thought that uh, it was interesting that it was by the Trump wall. Was that on purpose? That was the placement we got, yeah. But I liked it a lot. Yeah, because yeah, they started really to happy. look like refugees yes. or something yeah. after after yeah. dressing uh, up yeah. and everything. So. It is uh, um, clothes from uh, the thrift store, so it's uh, second hand. So mm. it wasn't their own clothes. Right. I made a performance, um, a five hours workshop where they brought their own clothes and it looked very different because there's things they wear. And have a relationship to somehow. <laughs> exactly. And here is like not their own clothes and it has another... It, it looks different somehow because yeah. there's also like clothes that are from... It's from another time. It's like... <laughs> some of them started looking like babushkas too. The way yeah. they were tying it around their head or, you know, like some sort yeah. of... Uh, it's because they can't uh, have more on their bodies. Yeah. I was really happy about the weather because it's been so hot in Denmark, unusually. So <laughs> they were everyone so nervous. Do we have to put it on? <laughs> it's like, yes, you have. But it's too much. Yeah, that's why it's a performance. You have to suffer for the art. <laughs> But so we got the weather with us. So what happened? How did you? How did it happen that you came here to do this? Well, I, I mean, um, I've been uh, working with the Gefion Gymnasium in Copenhagen mm-hmm. um, on a workshop on uh, sustainability, and um, yeah, we we have this performance is actually about um, yeah how much we overproduce and we over we also over consume it's so it's about that and my focus is on the clothes and the textile industry mm. how how we um, produce the clothes and yeah but over- how did it happen that you came to Roskilde then? Well, um, I was actually uh, invited by Art 2030 and uh, Louisa Fawaskal project, and um, we we are going to perform at different venues. Mm-hmm. And uh, we thought that Roskilde was uh, a real nice venue because it was more like 
today was like more like a happening. We just intrude a, a space here in Roskilde and start to do our stuff. Right. And I think it worked really well that it wasn't announced. It was a mistake that they didn't put the time on schedule, but uh, it uh, actually it worked very fine. Because there you was always, a lot of people. You always have an audience in Roskilde. School. School. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. I really need a beer now. <laughs> That was the thing. It was a big performance, and it took up a lot of space, and there was a lot of people involved. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I'm sure there was a lot of practice beforehand and everything. But I think you're right. It's a very good frame for it. It couldn't be better placed under these walls, the, these these mock-ups of the Trump-Mexican border wall. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it gave... I have some really great pictures of them gathered underneath these walls, putting on these clothes. Mm. Uh, but I mean, is it different? Have you tried working in a context like this before? Because I've seen, you know, you've been on the program before and we've, we've talked about this and you was very much more in an in a yeah. artist, artist context. Yeah, I, well, I was in Roskilde, what is it, 14, I think. Um, it was uh, under um, Sisters Academy and that was like a frame, a very framed venue mm. where we were to stay in our space. Mm-hmm. And actually, my piece at that time was, I think it actually, we actually went out of space and went to the public space here in Roskilde, where I, I, I think that for me to, to participate in Roskilde Festival as, as an artist, I, I actually want to, and performance arts, I want to mingle with the crowd. I want to mingle in the public space rather than being in a box. Right. This is, I'm used to being in a box. Mm. And I think the opportunity here is to take the public space and use the people who are just in the mood and in the mode to just be here and, and see just what happens. To be passing you know? by, you know, exactly. just right place, yeah, right yeah. time. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, what's going on over there? Exactly. So, I mean, I don't mind wasn't announced because I know there's going to be people somehow watching. If, it, if they find it interesting enough, they will stop and take their time. No. Yeah. And so, they did. Yeah. And they did. Do you feel like it's a difficult context in terms of, you know, trying to design a project or trying to think about what it's like? Or does it seem natural to you? I think it, it, it works here. I mean, because um, we are also here for the festival and consuming a lot of music and food and alcohol and summer and drugs, whatever we are. I want really, is... to smoke cigarettes. As soon as I got here, I was like, I want to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I think it works very fine here. It's just a very stupid logistics with the costumes and the clothes. It's so <laughs> dirty now. Yeah. We just spent, uh, there was a designer um, production, they, Sur Le Chemin, on the route, they they made this, I call them cloth islands, toy mm. the things that they are unwrapping and packing them in. Mm. It's like um, an item that should contain all your personal things in one, in one thing. It looks like the to the classic bundle that yeah. a, a, a traveler might carry over the shoulder on a stick. Yeah, like who beaten. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> the hobby, from yeah. this time. Yeah. But, I mean, there was a lot of uh, kind of immigration and, 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 and movement of human masses and stuff that I picked up in it. Not just the idea of overconsumption, but this idea of having everything you own on your back and them wearing everything they had. You know, it started to look kind of desperate almost, like this kind of, uh, you're forced. This is, un, this is unnormal behavior, so why are they doing this? And I immediately, I guess it's the walls, but again, I went straight back to this, like, refugees, people moving oh, around, great. fleeing, yeah. having yeah. to get away. Which is a weird, uh, it's a funny context together with a total, uh, almost, you know, a festival where That's there's, true. there's yeah. a lot going on and there's a lot of uh, extra uh, wealth here, to put it bluntly. Mm. Um, you know, so I thought it worked really well in that context. Also, mm. just the huge amount of people that are here. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because we, we, you know, the great thing about being an audience there is you get to hear other people. Someone walked up behind us and was like, what's this? Uh, I think it's something about uh, consumerism. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, so like people are just kind of <laughs> like, got it, got it. Yeah, they're yeah, just kind of yeah. like, all right, all right. You know, and so yeah. it's just they were just random people who were there, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's kind of nice because you you know it's somewhere like uh, Nikolai Kunstab where you showed mm. or, you know a couple of years ago. Yeah, no one's really wandering in off the street. No, no. <laughs> um, so I mean, I'm glad that the point obviously got out, and if it, if. It's interesting that some of my latest performances actually, I've been thinking maybe in other 
other directions but then like people are always putting it in this refugee context i guess we are also in amidst it all and well i mean you also focus got... and aware it's like in our bodies that we are aware about this total migration in europe and we can how to solve this problem and and yeah to settle it and uh, that's the thing about performance it's a it's something to do with our time you can't take it out of the context of the mm, time it's mm. performed in someone else mentioned handmaiden's tale when they were oh, wearing what, what? the handmaiden's tale it's a tv show that's on right now do you know about it no it's based off of a book by margaret atwood and the women are forced to wear these cowls these ah, uh, okay. uh as a sign of chastity and ownership oh. Okay. And it's a very it's about Great. sexual violence and uh, oh, wow. yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's a sort of That's heavy book. I haven't seen the show, but yeah, I've, yeah. I've read the book. And but immediately someone mentioned that because yeah. again, that's what's happening right now. It's on mm. television. People mm. are thinking about mm. it. So you can't ever divorce it from this context. Mm. Mm. And that's why maybe it's better just to have it in the big picture than yeah, here. yeah. Um, cool. Well, I think it went really well. I was mm. I enjoyed it. Um, do you, you think about doing more stuff like this? Well, we're doing it again tomorrow. But so, I think in more in the yeah. long term. Uh, yeah, I actually kind of started to, to work like this last year when I made a project in Brasilia with 100 <laughs> dancers. <Ooh. laughs> it was a technical uh, dance school mm. and I could use their dancers for my uh, workshop and performance. And we also went to the public space and invaded it and yeah, intruded <laughs> cool. uh, the public space, um, which I really found. It's a lot of strategic, but I think, and it's also very, has a fantastic impact when we, you can work with so many people. You can do very simple things that actually really works be also because there's a lot. And, and take the public space, I think. Yeah. I consider it like it's not a flash mob, but because it is kind of announced, but it, it it has an impact when there's so many people uniform doing the same same thing. Right, it, it's a whole different context. That's yeah. actually, I think, a really strong side of performance. It's hard to put art into the public in that sense. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's like, yeah. oh, we put a picture on a fence, dun 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 yeah. dun, 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 you know. Yeah. Whereas you guys can actually really vibrantly be alive and part of this mm -hmm. context. Yeah. Cool. Well, I know you're very busy, so uh, thank you for I your time. I need to help someone yeah, yeah. <laughs> with the costumes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, to bring it home, I spoke with the American artist and filmmaker Jillian Mayer. She was invited by the festival to create these sculptures called Slumpies, which she's going to talk about. And uh, I spoke to her just a few days before the festival opened. I'm going to stop the wandering intro. <laughs> Should I come down? No, you're saying if you slouch, I can see you underneath. Ah, oh, yeah. You're, oh, okay, this yeah. is the way to do it. Yeah. Ah, much better. I don't think I've ever done a podcast laying down before. Um, so the build's going okay? Yes, even the build though, is going great. Even though it's the biggest one you've ever done? Yeah, I mean, it is the most amount of sculptures I've made in a short time, but... It's important to challenge yourself, right? Indeed. <laughs> yeah, and it's also important to say yes when things show up. Well, I like uh, traveling in such a way where um, I'm given opportunities to go to different countries and exist there, not as a tourist, but more as a um, creative or a maker or some type of uh, semi-permanent uh, person or more like an like a little alien that just plops in for a designated amount of weeks and then gets to experience the culture and then go somewhere else yeah, and you get a little bonus network to work with which is great you know people can tell you you know stuff to see and places to go uh you know that that's often helpful instead of just showing up and looking at a guidebook or something yeah i'm not very good at maps either i'm really <laughs> i'm pretty good at memorizing what things look like but that takes being there for a bit to even have that uh, privilege to see what some place looks like. Yeah. So how does a how does an opportunity like building twenty sculptures for a large culture and music festival such as Waskula come about? Uh, the internet. The internet is where most of my communicative transactions occur. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely do I get any good news in the post mail. It's usually you wake up and you check your inbox because it can be some type of lottery machine with opportunities. It <laughs> well, either... it's not chance, right? I mean, well, there's either there's good news, there's rejections, there's like um, 
websites that are trying to sell you things and Nigerian princes. There's all types of information that circulates and occasionally you get one from a cultural festival in another country. So what you're saying is you didn't know anybody involved beforehand or anything like that? No. Uh, one of the directors of the art program, Meta, she had reached out to me um, and I get a lot of emails and some of them are from organized institutions and some of them are from just random people or people in there. Uh, graduating with their MFAs, and they'd really love to show some work of mine. Sometimes it's feasible, sometimes it's not. Mm. So it's just it's just kind of runs the gamut when it comes to chance opportunity emails. Yeah. So you open you open your email with an open heart. An open heart for an open email, which leads to a open Skype or Google Hangout appointment, so you can make sure the people are real. Yes, and not crazy. Although sometimes crazy is okay. Um, but, I mean, have you done anything like this before? Well, I've done commissions for uh, lots of institutions before and kind of tried to finish things, which always seems like it's a, a short, too short of a timeline uh, or too rushed of a process. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, but it always feels like that in some capacity. At least this time I had a month and I was able to bring some assistants over, which are also friends, because we are in tight quarters with tight schedules it's important that you really find your assistants charming yeah and yeah i can work under pressure and all that yeah everyone that i'm here with is really a pleasure so yeah so i was doing research on you obviously and it seems like you work mostly in either a film or a art institution context be it you know a museum or something like that but you also mentioned having done con commissions uh what I mean, how is it different when you're thinking about doing this? In this case, you have already made these slumpies, this project before, but do you consider anything different when you're talking about an audience of music festival guests? Honestly, I just try and make them a bit stronger because I assume that when you're dealing with the public at large, they might be not a, not 100% sure, but they might be a little more intoxicated than your average museum goer oh they will be <laughs> they definitely will be but the thing is really i have to have a some bit of responsibility in the way they are designed or finished public so, safety really yeah i don't want anyone to cut their leg on my sculpture and bleed profusely nor do i want to snag and rip someone's really cool outfit mm. yeah. so there is um you know every artist has some responsibility for the experience of their work and whether that's conceptually or time-based or physically, mm. you are introducing um, an object or an idea into the public and whether that's a person that is able to attend a museum one day or they are able to attend a cultural festival, I still think you have to have lots of regard for them. Mm. Well, one of the things that struck me about your work was that it, it which is something it's pretty rare, actually, I think, in the art world, is that it can exist in virtually any context. It doesn't need the frame of a museum or anything for it to have, um, you know, some sort of foundation for existence. You don't need a certain audience for them to interact with it. It's open. It's for everybody. Yeah, I try to make work that can exist on a lot of different levels and that can grow with you over time. Um I'm dealing with a lot of contemporary thoughts and theories, oftentimes about how technology affects us as we grow. And I don't think that's an exclusive topic that's reserved for, as I mentioned before, people that are able to go to museums or galleries mm. on their uh, free time. People, I mean, even free time is a privilege. We, I don't want to make work that only some people have the opportunity to see. And definitely the internet has been a large tool and influence in my work because of the platform it's able to be uh received by many by many people rather than just a certain audience mm. you could almost say everybody obviously it's not true but it is open in that sense um well, that's interesting because did you grow up in, a, in in an art world so to speak did you go to art school did you come from a family who went to museums or did you come in another way uh, I I guess my family has always supported me having an interest in art and 
when I was off school and they kind of needed to send me to some camp to keep me occupied during the weekdays, uh, somehow I always ended up at science camps or or art or performing arts camps. Mm. Um, a lot of theater? More theater, I think. It's funny, I come from that background too. I think it's kind of something you can do with your kids that you can count on to not be totally insane <laughs> like content wise i mean not that's actually not true because when you really look at what some of those theatrical plays were about they're kind of perverse or right being in greece can be all about you know good times in the summer or teenage pregnancy and like quasi rape you know and killing your parents <laughs> exactly i mean i guess the content was kind of intense but i might not have noticed till later on yeah but exactly. um i went to a high school where i was able to focus on photography hmm. uh, or at least take a couple more classes at that a day than other things but um i didn't know that it was a possibility to be a living contemporary artist i had no idea how things got into museums um my gallerist actually answers a lot of questions for me and friends that um have careers that are interesting or make cool work they tend to be a great resource for me to ask questions that could be a bit um maybe could sound a bit naive Mm. or but you learn as you go and this this kind of uh field is somewhat made up and Totally. Confusing anyways. <laughs> so I think it's okay to not know how things work always and they change all the time. Yeah, and it's okay to also not pretend all the time that you know what's going on, you know. It's not surgery. <laughs> I mean it's difficult it feels in like its, it's own ways. Part. I mean it's like complicated, sure. Yeah. But um whether I finish that sculpture or not, I hope no one ever faces life or death. Yeah. Did you ever get like, do you know, can you pinpoint a place where it turned for you where you realized there was uh, people that were living contemporary artists and you could even fancy being one? I don't know. It, it was gradual. I guess you start seeing friends that make things that are a bit older than you mm. and realizing they're real people and that institutions where galleries are excited about what they make. I, I mean, I guess I can't answer that question, but something that's always interesting to me as a director or as a performer or as an artist and getting to have this peer group of other creatives is that oftentimes we feel like the project is totally wrong or missing so many integral points, but the deadline is here and you must present it. And the reception of the project is well received and it's archived in a museum or an institution and you know that the artist feels so incomplete about it (laughs) that's something that has always been interesting and then there's always that saying that nobody your audience doesn't know what's missing yeah or doesn't know how wrong it is yeah or how off your intention it was yeah and the purest moment of art making is maybe the idea and everything else except the moment when you present it is horrible. <laughs> I guess I'm not a process person, though, so that should probably be noted. Say that, but it doesn't look... I, you, we, the audience doesn't notice. Let's put it that way. As someone who was just trying to dive into your work, I would say it's very much process. I just walked into a huge hall where you guys are in the middle of the process of building something. Well, there is a process to get to the final outcome. I do actually like the meditative quality of um, applying layers upon layers, but, I mean, there is something to be said about how nicely even clicking on the paint tool in Photoshop and it just dispensing a solid color. Bam! That's also beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I mean, do you, are you a testing person or do you uh, have it all ready to go in your head before you even start to make something? No. With, scu- with these type of sculptures in which I'll present, be presenting at Roskilde, festival it's um they take the shape as they go Mm, they are very much an additive process and um ideas change and affect them but there is material testing i would definitely say that i have a huge curiosity about materials and what i can get them to do uh, that's generally not normally considered by the contractors or construction workers that normally use these materials yeah. i generally use fiberglass in a really abstract way um and the shapes i uh go for are ones that are not traditionally associated with 
uh, some of the normal ways these materials are used, which might be for boat building or surfboard building mm. or like playground building sleek smooth lines puns. yeah smooth lines no bubbles mine are quite amorphous mm-hmm. and i don't think look very well sometimes they can be a bit peewee's playhouse or maybe like dali-esque i don't know yeah not brutalist yeah well how long have you been making these and where how did they come about in a sense i mean i know the impetus behind it with the fact that we're all flopping our backs onto whatever surface to look at our phones well there's a lot of reasons why i made those works but i definitely premiered the first one that i had made in april 2016 Hmm. at a solo show i had with my gallery david castillo gallery in miami florida and then after that i went on to have a show that was all slumpies and some slumpy videos at uh, Laxart in LA uh, the following June. Then they went to Chicago Expo in, um, I don't remember what month, the next year. And then they were also at MoMA PS1. Uh, my largest one I had ever built that fit five people was there. So they've just kind of been doing their thing, evolving. I had a show with them in New York. Uh, with art and buildings. So they've kind of just been changing. They take upon some reflectivity of the location that they're made in. Mm. Um, That's something that wasn't so intentional, but I feel as an artist, it becomes unavoidable in some capacity to not see your current location. Mm. Well, there's something to be said for making something many times, right? You know, even if it is the same, um, you know, even if it's different every time, it's the same base you're working with, you know? And Yeah, this, these works are within the same concept mm. and the same, like, thematic world. But I would say that they, construction-wise, are a lot better than when I first started. They are much more durable, much more uh, less likely to cut your leg open, mm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Did that happen? You keep mentioning that. I mean, it ha- I've definitely destroyed myself on these pieces <laughs> in the making process, but uh, no fingers have been lost by anyone, which is great. That's good. And I've learned to use a lot of tools and uh, learned a lot about chemistry along the way. Mm. Well, it seems like you know you are not partial to any single material process or type. Um, and And as someone who's very focused myself, I find it hard to think in terms of as many different things as you do whether it's films or photographs or sculptures or paintings or whatever i i kind of look at myself in some terms as a solutionist so i'm basically just trying to find the thing that makes the most sense for either the idea that i'm working through whatever medium or literally material that can do what I needed to do for a particular task. And you don't have a problem with uh, narrow-mindedness? I mean, my huge problem is that I'm just super narrow-minded in terms of like, oh, well, I'll make a photograph. You know, like I don't, it takes me six months to figure out, hey, this might be better as a sculpture or something. That sounds really stressful. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> that's probably a good answer for that. Um Maybe, it that's is, work, well, maybe that's why I work on so many different things. Right, to, to not have to think about it in terms of I, that. I just kind of feel like it's some type of oven. Your sketchbook is an oven and it kind of, you put the ingredients in and when it's ready to get made or eaten, I don't know if that's like a great metaphor, but um, <laughs> when it's me. ready to be prepared, it's ready. The there's ton. My sketchbook was full of tons of bad ideas mm. or ideas that just don't make sense for the time or maybe aren't ready yet. Or as maybe well it you're, should. Yeah, or maybe they're just ideas that are to a process piece that leads you to another idea. Mm. Do you, you mentioned theories earlier. Do you engage a lot with like art theory specifically or is it a lot more kind of technology and kind of broader than the art part of it? I would say I'm aware of different ideologies in contemporary art, but I'm probably more motivated by more social and tech and uh, behavioral concepts when it deals with thinking about people at large. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're interested in this system called the internet and the way it affects us as people. 
Uh, and yeah. the art world maybe isn't the first place to go for information about that. Well, I think maybe the art world is another tool. So in the art world, there's always this exploration of identity and this obsession with identity and self-portraiture and portraiture of others. Um, but perhaps it's more interesting to see how technology is affecting everyone's idea of the self-archive. Yeah. For me, at least. Do you honestly come from it from a point of no judgment? You know what I mean? Like you, you, your slumpies are not judgmental about what phones are doing to our bodies. And there's plenty of information out there, true or not, that can, you know, be meowing about how we're ruining our necks or, you know, this and that. Yeah, but I'm not a, I'm not like a device designer. Like I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm not an ergonomic factory. But that doesn't stop other artists from being heavily condemning of certain things, you know, well, like pick a cause. And... They sound really exciting. <laughs> um, I don't know. I am just making sculptures. Doesn't have to be more complicated than that. I'm making sculptures that are making people think about these things. Mm. I don't. I'm I'm still an artist. I'm not a design lab. I've had a bunch of things that people, a bunch of ideas that people have wanted to patent or perhaps work with in a more business level. But it comes to this point where I ask myself, is that what I really want to do? Like for the next three years is be pitching this like thing and devoted to this one perfect model to make another product. Like, I don't know, maybe I prefer to drift in and out be a bit more open-ended and yeah. spend my time making some artwork. You're yeah. only here for a short amount of time. Absolutely. And you can quickly get caught up in things that take too long and turn you down side paths, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. Well, I feel like I've used enough of your time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I never know how much I'll have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> speak <laughs> apropos. Um, but I'm excited about seeing the project. And, um, you know, it, I think it's a, a, new, a great context for them. I think it's a great choice by me to, to reach out to you for this. Yeah, I think it's a fun choice. And people, I mean, I don't know how the Danish will respond to them, but people approach them in a really interactive and fun way. And, People love to be involved, you know? And that's yeah, huge. they also function as some type of like stage or platform for people and give cultural cachet to show that people enjoy being near art. Do you... Um, I, I just saw this morning because of fucking Instagram that you might have a show in town. What, what's that? Uh, yeah. Um, so Are we after, to talk about that? So I'm making about 20 sculptures for the Roskill Festival, but after about 15 of them will travel to the Royal Theater in Copenhagen and be there in an outdoor sculpture show for a couple months. Mm. And then about five or six other ones will travel to 68 projects in Berlin for a, a two-person show there um, that will open August 2nd. August 2nd. Are you coming back for that? Yes, I will. I will be at the openings. Good times. Well, long live the slumpies. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your time. Bye. Oh, this is cool. My bye. Really? And that was it. That was Ross Gilda Festival Art Zone 2018. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Undergang Armchair. The intro and outro music is kindly provided by Johnny Ripper, and today's interstitial music was provided by RC. The show is also brought to you by the Great Artland app. You can read more about them at artland.com. You can find links to their music, tons of other conversations with great people, and a bunch of great podcasts on our music festival of a website, culturalbandwidth.com. If you do like this show, we would appreciate it if you take the time to leave a review on iTunes. It'll help others find us. Thank you so much for joining us. 